Victor has welcomed us um, to this place, I'd like to welcome you to the symposium on cultural commodification, indigenous peoples, and self-determination. And I'll just give you a moment to find a seat if you haven't already. Uh, so my name is Selene Roth, and I'm a LU scholar here at the LU Institute for Global Issues. I'm also a UBC-trained anthropologist, and I'm a member of the Intellectual Properties in Culture Issues and Cultural Heritage uh, Research Network, or project, that um, has helped organize this uh, day. Um, IPINCH, as we call it, is based out of Simon Fraser University. So it's at a co-chair of this network that I've had the opportunity to invite this uh, great set of speakers um, today, um, and I appreciate the opportunity, and I can't wait to hear their papers. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, George Nicholas to make his um, uh, opening remarks. Uh, George Nicholas is a professor of archaeology at Simon Fraser University, and as I said, he's the director of IPINCH. Um, and I'd like him to say a few words of introduction. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And of course, I want to begin by thanking Victor and our hosts for, for um, providing us with such a lovely venue, and especially to Selene Roth for being the primary organizer of this event. Um, what I want to do is give you some general remarks that help to contextualize this very um, complex set of issues that we simply refer to as commodification. And um, as Selene has mentioned, this is uh, an output of the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage Project. This is a massive seven-year global multi-sectoral uh, interdisciplinary project uh, we have team members all over the world, and um, over the course of these seven years, we're actually into year five, we have been exploring um, cultural tourism, commodification, uh, bioarchaeology, research ethics, and a host of other um, really pressing issues affecting descendant communities, especially indigenous peoples worldwide from the Ainu of northern Japan, to the Hopi of the American Southwest, to the Stolo of British Columbia, to the Saginaw Chippewa, uh, and to many other groups um, in Australia, New Zealand, and, and well beyond. And in approaching the, this set of issues, we have compiled um, a, a wonderful set of, of scholars and community representatives and experts in many fields. Uh, because the nature of intellectual property, intangible heritage, is it permeates all facets of um, heritage. And in fact, material items, objects, have no value without their intangible quality. So we cannot separate them. And an important starting point for, for my comments beyond giving a little bit of, of, of sense of the IPINCH project is this notion of commodification and what it is. And I'm not going to define it. Uh, that's something that will, I think, emerge from the collective uh, presentations this afternoon. But I do want to make a, a very simple point. And that is that when we're talking about commodification, we can look at this in several ways. One is as peoples of today and also people in the past being inspired by earlier generations as well as by other cultures. Uh, this should be very familiar, the Parthenon, uh, the Acropolis in Greece. And there are literally thousands of buildings in the world that are modeled on this. Uh, Europeans, for example, saw the Parthenon as the ultimate expression of human achievement in terms of architecture, and therefore copied it. But there are other interesting aspects, too, about commodification, whether it, it, whether it is as a celebration of, of heritage, and where might that celebration take place. And it often takes place in the marketplace, um, where we, we admire, we cherish items and images and objects from earlier times in other cultures. And one way we celebrate that is by possessing them as replicas or an image of an archaeological site or uh, a rock art image on a t-shirt. Now, where things get complicated is when you look at Harrods Department Store in London and you look at the Egyptian rooms 
And a number of people have looked at this as a kind of appropriation or commodification of Egyptian heritage. And then you point out that the owner of Herod's is Egyptian and, and therefore is you know, celebrating his own culture. Commodifications take many different forms around the world. And I'm, I simply want to give you a, a series of, of images that give you um, examples of some of the range of, of commodifications. And I could literally f show you thousands of examples, uh, but I think other examples will come out in, in the presentations today. Um, you go to the Great Pyramids of Egypt and you are beset by Egyptians selling um, uh, many, many different kinds of uh, replicas of, of their heritage. If you go into the American Southwest, uh, you will find many examples of images of rock art or pottery designs that are yours on a t-shirt or on jewelry. And here one of the issues that we need to be aware of is that for some indigenous peoples, that's not an image of an ancestor. The ancestor is in that shirt, in, in, embedded in, in that image, and you cannot separate it. Um, other kinds of commodifications where you have you know, the, 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 the world famous moe, the giant heads of Easter Island, being used to sell um, uh, cough medicine as well as tissue boxes. And on the one hand, you, know, you look at this and you may laugh and you say, you know, this is a very creative use of, of uh, you know, the, the form of these heads and you pull the tissue up through the nostrils. But ask yourself, how do Easter Islanders feel about this? Um, these examples are by no means limited to indigenous peoples, and you could go basically anywhere in the world, um, in this case to Ireland, and you have these, these prehistoric uh, images that the Irish are selling, are, are sharing with the world as a celebration of their heritage. Uh, the same thing for Australia, but again coming back to an indigenous context, the so-called dot paintings are ubiquitous. Uh, you can't go anywhere in Australia, in fact, many other parts of the world, without seeing these as, you know, iconic Australia. Uh, and, and certainly in British Columbia. I think many of you are familiar with, with questions about appropriation and commodification that came out uh, during the 2010 Winter Olympics, but certainly not limited to that. Uh, the Cowichan sweaters um, are reformulated, in a sense, uh, as commercial property, but uh, you know, finally, after protests from the, from the Cowichan and other First Nations, uh, a limited run series of quote unquote authentic Cowichan sweaters was produced. And of course, um, um, uh, Inuit heritage is widely marketed uh, throughout Canada and elsewhere, uh, and not just limited to what came out after the 2010 Winter Olympics, uh, when the Inukshuk were the official um, uh, um, um, logo of, of that. And one of the issues here is that these images, the Inukshuk is ubiquitous and you cannot go into a gift shop anywhere without seeing a dozen different forms. And what was once special is now commonplace. And just the other day I came across uh, these, these uh, uh, snow goggles, these ice goggles are now in replica form um, and quite expensive. They're 40 pounds, uh, 40 British pounds. So how do the Inuit feel about this? How do the Easter Islanders feel? How do the Hopi and other Southwestern groups feel when these images are used for keychains or tea towels or whatever the product is? Now we can understand, I think, why people are interested in possessing part of the past, whether it's their own past, their own heritage, or someone else's. And there are many different reasons for this. Uh, and, and this is just a small um, uh, umbrella kind of list. But the, here's the key point for me, and I think that this is something that we explore throughout iPinch, is that this kind of use of someone else's heritage is potentially harmful in a, in a number of different ways, uh, economic, and spiritual and, and cultural harms may come. Uh, the loss of authenticity, the loss of specialness as with the Inukshuk example. And so this is something that I think, you know, our panelists and, and the two day workshop that we're having after this 
are exploring in a number of different uh, contexts. Now, this isn't to mean that all commodifications are harmful. That's certainly not the case. And I think that all of us are aware that there are kinds of uses and marketing and sharing of the past that is appropriate. In fact, that some people want, we want to share, I want to share my culture with you, but only through these means, not some other things that could be harmful to me. And there are a number of mechanisms in place or are under development that are used to provide uh, indicators of authenticity. Because this is one of the problems that people have in gift shops or that, that Solen sees in her study of the giftware industry. People want to do, a lot of people want to do the right thing and you go into a shop and you don't know what is authentic. And, and, and so how do we get around you know, that, that, that challenge? And so there are a number of, of ways that are, are um, uh, available or in, uh, still in development. So these are some of the kinds of issues, and there's lots more to come over the course of this afternoon with our, our wonderful international panel of indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, uh, looking at issues of, of, of uh, you know, the, the benefits and, and, and harms or costs of sharing, uh, questions about authenticity, the flow of benefits, um, uh, licensing of traditional uh, icons, and, and much, much more. Um, so this is really what this panel is, is all about. It, it's to tease apart, it's to explore this notion of commodification in its many, many different forms. And um, I mentioned iPinch at the beginning of my, my remarks. There's much more that iPinch is doing beyond simply cultural commodification. We have a workshop on cultural tourism or panel discussions on cultural tourism at the Stola People of the Rivers Conference coming up, and we have many other uh, events that we're sponsoring. Our website is a source of, of, uh, of much information, so I encourage you to uh, explore it. And there's some literature that we have on the table. Uh, thank you. Thank you.